Open with me this morning to James chapter 1. James chapter 1, we're going to begin reading in verse 23 and go through verse 27, but we will be discussing more scripture than just this passage in James. James chapter 1, as we discuss the law of liberty or the mirror of God's grace. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is likened to a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, This man shall be blessed in his deed. If any man among you seem to be religious and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. Let us pray over the word. Gracious God, we thank you for this portion of scripture. We thank you that it is written to us and that we have been given a hearing ear and a receiving heart. I pray, Lord, that the gift of faith that you've given us would be exercised this morning and that, Lord, you would entreat your word with the Holy Spirit. Gracious Lord, I pray that you would give me the liberty of my calling and freedom to preach your word and every person here a willing heart to receive it. Lord, we are so thankful for the ability to understand your word. Lord, this morning I pray that the study of your word would glorify you. In Christ's name I pray, and amen. Here, James is one of the first epistles, some believing possibly the first, but one of the first epistles that have been written to the church. And you'll notice it is not addressed to a specific church, but it is a general epistle of James. It's kind of written just generally to the church at large. He identifies his audience in here as he says, James, a servant of God of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. So he doesn't write to Ephesus. He doesn't write to Philippi. He doesn't write to the church at Corinth, but he's writing to the 12 tribes scattered abroad. This is similar to Peter writing in 1 Peter after he writes to those individuals, which is the book directly after this, as he writes to those strangers scattered throughout the regions in which that he was traveling and writing. And he does identify them in Peter as being the elect according to the foreknowledge of God. So these individuals that were scattered are also those chosen of God to which he's writing. It's the same principle here in one of these early epistles before there were a lot of churches founded. What happened is in Acts chapter 8... You're going to see persecution coming from Saul. And then many of the believers of that age began to be scattered. The apostles staying stationary in Jerusalem and the believers going back to the region in which they were from. It's probable that in Acts chapter 2 you see that influx of thousands of people during the day of Pentecost. And then after the Holy Spirit came down, they all heard in their own dialect. You see in Acts chapter 6 that there is a plethora of Jews still there, the Hebrew Jews and the Greek Jews. All were Jews, but they were coming from different areas. So they just decided to stay. They decided to stay in Jerusalem. You know, this happens when you have a good church meeting. You don't want to leave, right? (laughs) I'm not looking forward to Monday. (laughs) Monday is one of those days after a church meeting that I'm just like, I can't do it. I can't Monday today. You know, and I only have four Mondays left for the school year, but all I can think about is what's going to happen on Monday and all that I have to do because I have to go to Mobile, uh, not Mobile, but Gulf Shores and do a presentation at one of our conferences and say, well, bless your heart, you get to spend it at Gulf Shores. Yes, in a conference, (laughs) which means I have to sit and listen to people tell me things that matter not to me at all, nor do I care because it's the same thing every year. And I have to go sit and they're actually making me do a presentation on Friday. Yay me. 
Brecca was going to go, and when she had to cancel, because we have a child with a concert, and ended up staying at a Holiday Inn instead of the condo, because, you know, I'm not going to sit with my transparent glow-in-the-dark self on the beach by myself. So, you know, I don't even know where I was going with that. But, <laughs> but in general, you know, this past week, I remember, I'm just thinking about Monday. So I want to stay in this weekend. I really wish I could. These Jews probably stayed at Jerusalem for a while until persecution started and they began to scatter they began to go back to their own regions and so he's looking at all of those of jewish ethnicity that have scattered throughout the region and he's writing to them under the assumption that they're having the possibility of going back to judaism due to persecution and due to trials this is first identified in the epistle of james when he says my brethren count it all joy Count it happiness, count yourself blessed if you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh, worketh patience. So the entire epistle is written here under the idea that they are facing some type of temptation and trial and that their reaction to that should be rooted in who they are and based on the goodness of God and also how he has begotten them through the word of truth. Their conversion, not their regeneration, but their conversion had come through the word of truth, and God had drew them to be a first fruits for the Gentiles. This was probably something that we don't really know as much about, but the first Jews that came to believe in Christ, it seems that they faced persecution and from Peter's writings also faced being, having their faith tried. In verse 7, the trial of your faith being much more precious than gold in First Peter chapter 1. So this was a group of believers that had come to the knowledge of the truth, had come to the knowledge of Christ, and then faced trials. This does happen to us. Anybody that decides to follow Christ, or let's say... A person decides not to follow Christ, but they've already been a follower of Christ, but they're deciding to follow him more diligently, or maybe they're deciding on uh, whether it be baptism or Lord's um, focusing on the Lord in the local church. Whenever a person gets serious about the truth or about Jesus, they're going to face some type of backlash and persecution. When we're doing right, Satan's going to be as a roaring lion seeking to hinder us. That's what he does. Now, I'm thankful that Satan is on a very short leash. I'm thankful that Satan can't overwhelm us and take us out of Christ. But in God's sovereignty, he so allows us to be tempted and to be attacked by Satan, just as he did Job. And when we try to diligently seek him, we get a target on our back. We get to where we're the person that he will be focusing on. And he does it in different ways. You can say that, you know, brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations in that verse too. That may apply to these believers as being rejected in society. I'm thankful that at this present moment that most of us don't feel the reason of being rejected in society. You know, living in St. Clair County, we're immune from some of that. And I can kind of sit back and just say, hey, I can talk about my faith openly. I'm still a little bit nervous. And I'm still a little bit, you know, I don't want to, you know, get overstep until July 1st. If you don't understand why I'm saying until July 1st, well, then just ask me later on, on the live stream. But when July 1st, I can be a little bit more open about my faith. I don't have to worry about it. Uh, in education, you'll know what I'm talking about. But, you know, I have kids asking me, um, where do you pastor? Where do you pastor? Where do you, I want to go to your church. I'm always nervous because you don't know what kind of backlash the teachers are going to give. I mean, the parents are going to give. You know, we can have backlash for our faith. It can just be that when we see ourselves following after Christ, that we can possibly have backlash in a different form. There's lots of different things that can hinder us. As I said yesterday, Satan can often find a chink in our armor and say, all right, that's where I'm going to hit him. Whether it be gluttony, discouragement, depression, unbelief, whatever it may be, Satan's going to find that one chink and attack it and pressure it. It's a reality that hits every single one of us that the greatest, the greatest endeavor in life is going to give us some of the greatest trials. It's easy to sit back and not do, 
you know, sometimes I'll look at all the mistakes that I have, and it just means that I've lived a life worth living because I made mistakes. If I wasn't making mistakes, I wouldn't be doing anything. And when somebody follows after Christ, it may be hard, but it's the only thing that shows us that it's a life worth living. When we see trials and we see frustrations, it gives us the immediate evidence that we are doing something right because we're facing friction. If you've never faced friction, you've never really followed Christ. I'm not saying you're not his. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying your car's in park, right? (laughs) It ain't going very many places. It's just sitting there. And so he acknowledges to them, hey, if you lack wisdom, you know, know that patience has her perfect work, wanting nothing, patient or perfect work, meaning it's complete, mature work, patience becomes mature, and then you understand that if you lack wisdom, you can seek God. So it's kind of this framework that he's giving. You do see trials, however, don't give up. Don't be a double-minded man, as he would say in verse 7, and don't be only a hearer of the word. Don't blame God for our failings, as he says, no man can say he's tempted of God because you're tempted when you're drawn away of your own lust, but God gives you good gifts to fight the temptation. And after he says in verse 42, I mean in 22, but be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. He's saying be active in following Christ. Do not deceive yourself in thinking that you are when you're not, but lay aside all filthiness, superfluity of naughtiness. I love the way the KJV word stuff's the superfluity of naughtiness. I give you the homework of trying to use that in a sentence this week. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> see if you can fit that into a sentence, the superfluity of naughtiness, and then see if anybody's eyes gets raised. And receive with meekness the engrafted word. Receive the word, the spoken word, that is also the engrafted word, what's been written on your heart, which is able to do what? Which is able to save your life. It's able. Remember, he's writing to believers. When he says it's able to save your souls, what he's saying is it is able to make you have a stable life. It's to deliver your life from the issues of life. But then he starts in verse 23 after saying, don't deceive yourselves, of giving us an image of a mirror to let us see why we should be doers of the word and the implication of that. For if any man be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is likened to a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. Three things we're going to see in the entirety of this text. One, the mirror of grace. Two, the liberty therein. And then three, pure religion. So first, we're going to see the mirror of grace. He says, if a person hears the word and is not a doer, he's like a man beholding his face in a glass. You know, we have mirrors all in our house, and we're all vain. I guarantee you that if you walk by a mirror, you're not going to be able to stop and not look at it, right? Some of us uh, in today's, I look and I see more and more pepper as it is. And I told somebody yesterday, even though the pepper just continues to grow, you know, we salt food with pepper and salt. We make sure we season it. That's a better word. We season it with pepper and salt. So you know what that means? That means even the best of food tastes better with a little pepper. So I don't mind the pepper, right? It just makes it a little bit more savory. And I, you know, I'm going to keep telling myself that. But we look in the mirror. I, I neither confirm nor deny that somebody that I'm very close to, the first time they saw a gray hair in the mirror, may have plucked it. I neither confirm nor deny that, that that is something that that happened. I also neither confirm nor deny that when somebody looks in the mirror now, there may be too many to pluck. But <laughs> um, that's what happens, right? As we get older, the mirror doesn't look the same. But if we look at ourselves in the mirror now, we wonder what happened. I don't look like I used to. And then all of a sudden, it's all different. Everything's changed. Why are those crow's feet there? As my children have told me in the past, we know that you're old because your face is cracked. Thanks, kids. We know that you're old. Look at the white. I have a hat with a year on it, and my kids tell me that was the year I was born. It happens to be in the 1600s. The mirror isn't as kind as it used to be, but we still look in it. We still try to look our best from a young age. Children parting their hair like dad or 
girls looking and just pulling their hair back. I'll never be used to having a female in the house that's not my wife. And we look in the mirror. And sometimes we can go away with great confidence when we look in the mirror. You know, looking at this mirror analogy, the first time I read this, I consider it to, it to be almost as if look, looking into a mirror of like depravity. Not in the good, but in the bad. Seeing all of our negatives and walking away negative. You'll re- you may or may not remember this, but in 2008, not long after I was liberated, I was married in June 28, 2008. Had to make sure I got that exact year right. Um, we got engaged on June 23, 2007. So in the fall, the Wetumpka Association, I believe it was 2008, was held here. And as a young, liberated gentleman... I came up and I preached on this passage. I was just seeing if anybody remembers it. (laughs) No, of course not, right? But I remember preaching on the passage, and I made mention then that I used to look at this as being looking into the face of the And There's some truth to that because we have to see who we are to understand or who we were to understand the blessing of who we are now. You know, one thing that the mirror does tell us is our our inadequacies. In Romans chapter 3, after Paul identifying the fact that all are under sin, that every single person, both Jew and Gentile, is under the bondage of sin. He then begins to describe from the Psalms and Isaiah what that means. Now, in Romans 1 and 2, he goes from chapter 1 of describing how the entirety of society pre-flood slowly gets worse and worse, and this is indicative of the depravity that society is in to the point where sexual immorality gets worse and worse, and it just begins to open and snowball to the point where all of society is given over to a reprobate mind, In chapter 3, he begins to show that true Jews are those who are circumcised in the heart and to both Jew and Gentile are under sin. He then says in verse 9 of Romans chapter 3, What then? Are we better than they? No, in no wise, for we have before proved, that being in chapters 1 and 2, both Jews and Gentiles, that they are all under sin. There's not a single person that is born into this life that is not under sin, and he says we have already looked in these scriptures in chapter 1 and chapter 2, which I remind you that the chapter marks were not there then. So when he says it was before proved, he's saying you've already read in the scroll that it was before shown that everyone in society, the Jews that had the oracles of God and the Gentiles pre-flood society are all under sin. Every person is under sin to the point to where in Romans chapter 5, he goes on to say in verse 12, wherefore as by one man sin entered in the world and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men for all have sinned. Death is proof that all people are sinners. And then he says that all are under sin, and he goes to begin what's almost like a vortex idea. He uses tons of scriptures and pulls them all down to one central theme that we're all sinners. He says in verse 10, there is none righteous, no, not one. This is from Psalm 14. There is none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way, they are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. He then in verse 13 begins uh, to reference other psalms such as 5 and 140 when he says their throat is an open, open sepulcher and their tongues they, shall have, they have used deceit. The poison of asp is under their lips. He says their throat is a graveyard. Their tongue is full of lying and under their tongue is only poison. He quotes Psalm, four, or psalm 10 in verse 14 whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Again, he quotes Isaiah, their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. The way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God in their eyes. He pulls it all together to describe why we are the way we are in saying that there is no fear, there is no reverence 
there is no sober thoughts from them, from us, before God. Now he's going to go on to say, we know what the law saith, now that we're all under the law and we are all found guilty, but the view is rather bleak. You know, if I looked in the mirror at that point and saw depravity, what I would turn around and do is say, do we not have a filter for that? (laughs) Have you ever seen on social media people that you know don't look like that? begin to put on a filter, and you're like, okay, you're about 10 years older than me, and I don't look like that. There ain't a blemish, there ain't a wrinkle, there's not a zit, there's not nothing on that person, and you're like, you do not look like that. There's no way you look like that. I'm personally proud of the way that I look. I know I'm no spring chicken anymore. You know, I'm still young, because the Jewish idea was you go from young to old at age 40, so I've got two and a half more years before I can say that I'm an older gentleman. That's why he called Timothy young, because he was under 40. Typically, in Jewish standards, you weren't considered non-young until you had 40. So I'm young, <laughs> but I'm not as young as I once was. But, we, you know, some of us get proud of it. Some folks, when they hit that area to where they don't want to look like they look, they put a filter on. You know what the bad thing is? When that filter hits, they still actually look the way they look. If you ever see somebody on the filter, then see them on a specific app that takes pictures of their faces and then puts them to let you know why they spent overnight in a place so they don't look like the way they put the filter on right i know y'all check that app too (laughs) everybody does most people do in the morning to see who's all there and they kind of you know we look to see and the filter's gone you know any of our works that we try to do to make ourselves look good apart from the grace of god is like putting on a filter it's almost like putting on deodorant all it does is calm the stench the stench is still there that filter calms the wrinkles it keeps us from appearing to look unrighteous in front of other people but all of our works all of our ideas all of our worship everything apart from the grace of God and apart from faith which he instills in our soul anything apart from that is sin and is nothing different than a filter that takes away the blemishes You know what? The Pharisees, as they stood up before God and said, Lord, I thank you. I'm not like other people. All they were doing was putting on a filter before God, and God saw right through it. There's only one thing in this life that takes that sinner that was a horrible wretch, all under sin, whose mouth and throat is a graveyard spitting poison, full of lies and deceit. There is only one thing that we can find to where we can look in something that is not our own works and see something without blemishes. You see, if we consider this to be who we were apart from grace, or even our works apart from the grace of God, if we think that's the mirror, we're missing the point. When we look in a mirror, we see the blemishes, not a, not a social media filter. When we look in the real mirror and see ourselves who we are apart from God's grace, what we're going to see is something looking back at us that is unfit to stand before God. You know, when I look in the mirror, I think about, you know, we begin to see how we're not as young as we once were, how hair is not what we wish it to be. Some of you may have some antidotes for that. I remember, I've told you all this before, when I was a little, I thought men's hair turned white and women's just had kept the same color. And then as I grow older, I was like, oh, that came, that's not natural, right? I won't say much more past that, but you realize that everybody's hair turns gray pretty quick. And we may not want to see it. See, this isn't talking about depravity necessarily. It's talking about something better. Seeing our face in a glass, I've I've likened it unto this. You know, we need to know where we came from because what we presently experience will not mean anything apart from where we came from. We need to know that we are a sinner apart from God's grace. We need to know that apart from God's grace that we would seek unrighteousness, that our mind is at enmity against God. We need to know that we are unable to please God apart from his son, Jesus Christ. We need to know that, but we need to know it in the same way that as we're driving down the road, we have a mirror that showed us where we came from. If we're focused on the rearview mirror, we're going to be in a bad place, right? (laughs) If we're focusing on it, we're going to drive off and hit something. 
what we need to do is focus on what's in front of us, the windshield that's wide, that's showing us where we're going. We're headed to glory. Yes, we came from depravity, but depravity is now something that we're looking in a rearview mirror, knowing where we came from, yet the windshield is much wider than that. The grace of God is much deeper, is much wider, is much higher. And so when we see the grace of God, we're seeing something, we're seeing where we're going in contrast to where we've came. It's often the same way as understanding the way you look at a diamond. I've used this in the analogy in the past. When we hold a diamond up, it looks pretty, but if you hold it up against black velvet, it's going to, be, it's going to shine brighter. That rearview mirror is what makes where we're going look better when you appreciate what you have. But this isn't the mirror we're told to look into. Depravity isn't what we're said to check out. When he says, for any man be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. So he's speaking of what present manner of person they are at the moment when he says, but whosoever looketh into the perfect law of liberty, that being the liberty of Jesus Christ, continueth therein, being not a forgetful here, but a doer of the work, that man shall be blessed in his deed. So he's saying that when we see who we are in Christ, it should change everything. In other words, when we see the riches that we have in Jesus Christ, that law of liberty, the absolute nature of the liberty that we have in Christ Jesus in comparing to the Old Testament law, when we are given that, we should walk away from that remembering who we are. You know, if a person looks in the mirror and sees themselves impoverished, coming from poverty, they're going to act accordingly. Well, I say that. Um, nowadays with the national debt, they may just act like our federal government and just say, you know, I know we ain't got the money, but we're going to spend it anyway. There's a lot of people that when you meet, they're impoverished, but they live like kings. You know, that's not smart. If I don't have, I don't spend. But there's a lot of people that have a lot and can go away and say, I know the worth, the self-worth that I have, and I can go away and act accordingly. I've always found it interesting that when you see a royal grow up, and all of a sudden they reject their royalty. And I'm like, man, I wouldn't reject that. I don't care what pomp and show they have to make me do to have that, you know? Put Prince beside my name any day, right? <laughs> have me be the duchess of some random city in the middle of nowhere of Ireland, you know? I'll take that. But so many of them grow up and just walk off. And many people, though, they are the son of the king look into that mirror and walk off and don't act like it. There's a sermon preached by a Pentecostal pastor about my dad. The name of the sermon was Be Like Dexter. Many of y'all know dad as Brother Vaughn, that sweet teddy bear, right? Well, I knew him as Dexter uh, from the police officers. The Hispanic population called him Diablo. The, if you don't know what that means, that's Spanish for devil. <laughs> Um, the urban population called him eyes because his eyes shot out two inches from his head, just barely outreaching his jugular chin and eyebrows. And the Pentecostal preachers talked about how dad would walk in the authority of the law. And when my dad showed up, he was a man. He would step out of the car as a man, and he acted like a man. One time, I think it was Nolan Shivers who trained him, got out of the car and started screaming at a couple of thieves and the men dropped to the ground and started shivering. And I think it was Nolan stood up and began to think he was pretty big and bad until he turned around and saw my dad standing behind him with a 44 Magnum Clint Eastwood revolver <laughs> screaming. And then he said, nope, it wasn't me. It was Dex. Dex could clear a crowd. He could clear a riot in 10 minutes without anybody else helping. One time somebody began to shoot and shoot at them from a back alley during a riot in Gate City. And as all of the police officers were standing behind fire hydrants' cars, Dad was on the hood of a police car screaming, You coward! Come and get me! He wasn't scared. He walked in the authority he knew he had. And that's the point that the minister made about my dad. He walked knowing who he was. He walked in authority. He didn't back down. 
you know, as a son, we always tried to fill those shoes, never going to. My brother and I may be as loud and half crazy as dad, but we're not as mean. <laughs> he could turn it on when he wanted to. You know, we tried even as his children to walk in that authority, but we couldn't match that. But we tried. We thought dad was the toughest man you'd ever meet. And honestly, he wasn't the strongest, but he could whip anybody. <laughs> Simply because he was so mean, they were scared of him. I could give you all story after story between throwing people off a bridge to catching uh, <laughs> tents on fire, shutting down the interstate, everything else. I won't give you all all the stories, but he walked in the authority he knew he had. You know, and we see ourselves in light of the grace of God. You know, I am nothing. Before God, I am, yea, less than nothing. Isaiah says that our righteousness is as filthy rags. The best you can bring to God is nothing. You have nothing. You are nothing. You are worthless and deserving of nothing apart from the imputed grace and righteousness God has bestowed upon you. You deserve hell for eternity apart from God's grace. So when we look in ourselves, we deserve nothing. But when we stand in the presence of the grace in which God has planted us and see who we are and what he has done for us, we're not looking at ourselves, but we're looking at the grace of God and turning around and saying, I'm the son of a king. I'm the son of God. We behold ourselves into that perfect law of liberty. We've not been placed into the law of depravity, the law that he had given in Mosaic in the Moses time, the Mosaic law, we're not placed in that, but we have been taken from it. Though those laws still against us, Christ covers it as our sin was imputed to him and his righteousness imputed to us, that perfect law of liberty. Now when God sees us, he sees us not in the position we are, but he sees us through the blood of Christ. And we likewise need to stop looking at God from who we are and our failures, but looking through the perfect law of liberty in Christ. We've been freed from the, that law, the Mosaic Old Testament law. We've been freed from a, something we cannot keep. We've been freed from hell. And he says, when we see ourselves in that perfect law of liberty, when we see that we've been delivered from hell, we've seen we've been delivered from the bondage of sin and the bondage of the Mosaic law. When we have pull, been pulled from that and see the liberty that we have, it should change the way we walk. It should change the way that we do. It should change the way that we think. And this can only happen to a sensible sinner. Romans chapter 7, as Paul is writing, speaking of his relationship to the law, he's going to describe it as a marriage. And he says that the marriage lasts until the spouse dies. And he says, now that I, um, I have been made dead to the law through Christ quickening me, and I've been born again, when I was made dead to it, sin revived and I died. He says, when I was finally drawn to God... When I was quickened by God's grace, the law finally had real meaning. You can envision Paul as the Pharisee standing up and thinking he's doing everything right until on that road to Damascus and God smacks him down and says, boy, who do you think you are? And puts him on the ground and that law that he thought he was fulfilling all of a sudden was now the law that destroyed him. He thought he was perfect, but now all of a sudden he is understanding his own depravity and as he begins to try to reconcile that he realizes that he cannot keep the law sin revived and I have died to the point where he says what I want to do I don't do and what I do don't want to do I do he says a wretched man that I am who shall who shall deliver me from the body of this death I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord, so then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. He says, I thank God for Christ, and this is what happens when we see ourselves from the law of liberty. It's freeing. It's liberating. You know, it's interesting when we understand who we are. 
what happens. Y'all have heard me tell that story about how we were, you know, the first couple of days that we were in Beijing, China, it was just all sorts of novelty. When I tell people that we had Peking duck and we dipped duck skin in sugar, they look at me like it's nasty. I'm like, you have no idea. <laughs> it, was an eight. it was amazing. Ate like kings for a few days. I lost tons of weight because they don't have the same junk we got. Told Rebecca, next time we go to the beach, we're going to spend about three weeks in China. I <laughs> look real good before we come back. <laughs> you know, <laughs> spend more on the vacation to pre-prep for the beach before we even get there. And it just, it was amazing. But after a few days, the novelty wore off. And I missed home, missed it real bad to the point where we were crying. We were actually crying in the airport before we left. The novelty wore out. It was still nice, you know, walking around cities that feel like you're in a James Bond movie. It just feels cool. And we go staying there to the point where after about a week, all we ate was Pizza Hut, McDonald's, KFC, and then occasionally something else. You think that sounds disgusting. I was like, it didn't when it tasted like home. You can say, that sounds bad. Well, it, it didn't when you missed home. And we finally get to the embassy, and it feels like we're almost there. I see the American flag, and I don't care what, I don't care what president was on the wall. I wanted to kiss the picture. I don't care if he had a D or an R in front of it. I'm like, that looks like home. We finally get into Atlanta for the last layover between Shanghai there. And I, when we walk out of customs and we see that sign that says, Welcome to the United States of America, I said, Baby, we're home. Freedom, right? Freedom. Liberty. They had signs in Beijing that said democracy, liberty, freedom, justice. And I'm like, you keep using those words. I don't think you, <laughs> I don't think it means what you think it means, right? You know, because it didn't mean the same thing there. But then when we get off the plane to walk into Atlanta, I was like, freedom, freedom. Chains felt like they fell off. It reminds me of the book Pilgrim's Progress when they tell the pilgrim, when you get to where you're going, the burden will fall off by itself. The freedom we have when we look into Christ, because he says this perfect law of liberty, and when we continue therein, when we understand who we are, that we are the child of a king, not any special nature that we have, but because God has created us unto good works. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10, that we read first thing this morning, tells us, for by grace you are saved through faith. You've been saved by the grace of God. God has given you the gift of faith. Not of works, lest any man should boast, for you are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. You are the workmanship of God, and if you have come to a knowledge of the gospel, the knowledge of the truth, it is evidence of the gracious state he has placed you in and drawing you to himself. So when you see the gospel message, if you have eyes to see that mirror, it's because God has given you the blessing of being able to see yourself not only for who you are as a sinner, but see yourself in the presence of God. If you have eyes to see, it's because God has given it to you. If you can look up, rejoice, you're a child of the king. I've said it this way before. The reason you can see yourself in the mirror is because you have eyes to see. Try explaining to somebody what it looks like in a mirror that can't see. Try explaining the color red. Have you ever thought about how you conceptualize things both through um, our audible senses and you can say this is just confusing but you think your audible senses we frame the way we think around words those that actually use sign language frame what they think in their head around the other senses because there's no audible and so we can discuss things audibly but they're framing stuff through other senses try explaining somebody that can't see what the color red looks like they have no framework to understand what the color red looks like even with me, I'm not colorblind, but when Rebecca and I start talking about color, she sees blue, I see gray. I'm like, no, that's gray. She's like, no, that's green. I, I'm like, I don't know. You know, we, we see things differently. Imagine trying to explain to somebody what a color looks like they can't see. They can't see it. Same thing as like the grace of God. They can't see depravity unless they've been given eyes to see. And they can't see the law of liberty unless they've been given ears to hear and eyes to see and faith to receive. So if you are able to look into this mirror, it's because you've been given grace to see it. And he says, because of that, continue therein. The person that continues therein looks into this law of liberty, is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work. This man shall be blessed in his deed. He says, the doer of the work who sees the law of liberty, this man or woman shall be blessed in their deed. 
This isn't saying they'll be blessed because of it or that we are indebting God to bless us. But what this is saying is that we will be blessed in the action. God blesses us in the action of following him. We're not indebting him to us, but we're blessed in following the way of righteousness. He then finishes by saying what this looks like. He finishes by showing what this looks like. If any man among you seem to be religious and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain or empty. It's vanity. Two things that he gives for religion here, and people look at religion as this horribly bad word now. I don't want a relation. I don't want religion. I want a relationship. Is a popular cliche word or phrase. I'm sorry. It's like. It's a phrase, not a word. It's like I heard Charles Barkley say the other day, two words, and then he said like ten. I'm like, good job, Charles. <laughs> He's from Leeds, but, you know, he graduated a little bit after my parents. But, you know, a phrase that people will say is it's not about religion, it's about a relationship. I, dif- I disagree. You're not going to have a proper relationship without religion. Relationship is built on what you're doing. You know, even with my wife, relationship is built on what I'm doing. Relationships are going to struggle if we're not doing something. My relationship with my children can struggle if I'm not doing. And here, in the bad sense, but shown of what religion is supposed to look like. Later in chapter 2, which we're not going to make it to chapter 2, but I wanted to, He speaks of justification by works, meaning that we're declared to be who we are through our actions. We're justified by the blood of Christ on the cross. We're justified in our mind by the gospel and through faith. And we're justified by our actions in the courtroom of our peers. And he's showing what it looks like that people see our faith. As Brother Tim talked about yesterday, our faith can be seen very often through our actions, and that's justification by works, a person who's acting from who he is. And faith without works is dead, being alone. So what does he say? There's a few things that he gives here. One, that religion is worked out through speech. He gives the negative, any man among you seem to be religious, but bridled not his, bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain. This idea of bridling like a horse being under control, something that is powerful, something that can really hurt you, something that can hurt other people, we keep it under control. We keep our tongue tamed. Presently, it's popular to say, well, I like him. He says it like I want to hear it. You know, he, he speaks his mind. You know, I get that's popular in the political world and even on under media outlets and even under political figures. I get it. We like to hear people told off. (laughs) I think somewhere in the past four years, my filter broke, and I have to tell myself, calm down. (laughs) Don't say what you're really thinking all the time. So not bridling our tongue can be an image of not being religious. Why is that? Because when those that blasphemed the Holy Ghost and said that Christ was acting out of the power of the Beelzebub, he looked at those that said that, the wicked Pharisees, and said, out of the abundance of your heart, the mouth speaks. In other words, the mouth is indicative of the position of the heart. I've often said this, you know, one thing that never lies, and I'm not going to tell you the full quote from the pulpit, one of the two things that never lies is a child, a toddler. They'll tell you the truth in a heartbeat. You, you, riding, you riding a buggy through a store, and all of a sudden you pass by the uh, beverage aisle, and somebody looks and says, that's mommy and daddy's drink. Well, they lie. <laughs> they're telling the truth, right? <laughs> they're saying, hey, look, that's what mama drinks. Be quiet. The preacher's there, right? You know, as I'm walking beside my wife and kids. I'm kidding. <laughs> you know, they'll point and say things. You'll get there, and we went to a church service once, and there was a preacher there. Have you ever seen uh, the Disney old Peter Pan movie where there was a big giant with a round nose? There's a preacher in Mississippi that looks just like that. We went to a Christmas singing. We're sitting in the back because we got children. Because that's what we do. You know, people with children sit in the back typically. So we're sitting in the back. And this preacher walks in, my oldest, looks and says, Daddy, it's the giant. And I'm like, you're not wrong, son. But shh, you little heathen. 
you know, out of the abundance of the child, or out of the abundance of the parent, the child speaks. They tell all of our secrets. It's like when a parent says, I don't know where he learned those words. <laughs> I do. You know, sometimes our mouth tells on us too. It tells us the position of the heart. And if we don't bridle it, if we don't control it, what we're showing is an unbridled heart. And we're deceiving our own heart. And if our speech is not what it needs to be, then our religion, our pursuit of Christ is vanity and it's vain. Yes, tough words need to be said, but tough words under the banner of Christ. Christ said tough words, but Christ never sinned. And so our tongue must be brought under a bridle. Not only whatsoever our the position of our heart shows our mouth, the position of what we text, tweet, post shows our heart. So that's the first thing that he gives. The next thing he says is pure religion, unadulterated religion, religion without impurities, religion without any of the imperfections, religion that as it were just like a weld has had all of, I think it's called the flux go to the top, all the imperfections go to the top, and now the metal is in its most purest form, just like silver and gold tried seven times, went through the fire, pure religion, unadulterated religion, religion that is true and pure, is seen in this capacity, not only a a mouth and behaviors that are in control, imaging the heart, but also pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows and their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. So true religion is what? It's done in two ways. It don't look like the world. It's unspotted from the world. You know, sometimes people will say, well, you know, the church is just struggling. We need to look more like the culture. I, it was funny. This morning I had, we were talking about something. There was a quote from a popular uh, reform pastor, and he made this statement. He said, don't dress like the Puritans. Well, I don't like that. I want to wear a j- wig like John Gill. I mean, I think it would look good if I came to church in one of those wigs and one of those black robes. I think we could pull that off. That would look nice. But, you know, don't dress like them. Why? Because we're not Puritans. We don't live in the 1600s, right? (laughs) We don't live in the 1700s. We don't have to look like them. And so where the culture doesn't contradict the word of God, we can act like the culture, right? When we went from the big fluffy suits to the skinnier suits, I changed. Even though I still wish we'd go back to those. Y'all remember the four-button suits? I I wish we still did those. I loved those, but I'm not going to. I love those suits. Why? Because people don't wear them now. You know, it's not wrong to look like the world where it doesn't contradict Scripture, but when God has given, thus saith the word of God, whether it's the way we conduct ourselves in the house of God, whether it's singing, preaching, and praying, when God has spoken, he's saying, do this, don't look like the culture. You'll remember when Moses came down from the mount and he heard the children of Israel worshiping false idols, it sounded like war. We're not to sound like war, we're not to sound like the world, we're to look like what God has commanded. We're to be unspotted from it, be holy as God is holy. Yes, we can dress like it's 2023. We can worship in a building that looks like it's 2023. But wherever the word of God contradicts the world, we keep ourselves unspotted from it. And then secondly, what he names first is to visit, to take care of the fatherless and widows in their affliction. It's pure religion and unadulterated, undefiled. What does it look like? It looks like a family that's taking care of those most at risk. A person that's in need, seeking them out. A person that's hungry, feeding them. A person that is needing clothes, clothing them. A community of believers that's religion is looking to how Christ has clothed them in righteousness and that is willing to close others physically. A person that sees that Christ feeds us with manna from heaven and says, I will do likewise. A person that says Christ visited us from heaven to earth and says, I will likewise visit my brothers and sisters. A religion that says, I will not look like the world that takes those that are at risk and abuses them, but I will look like God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, who in our time of affliction and depravity said, regardless of their position, though they are without strength, I will die for these ungodly people. It's that mirror we look into and then image who we are as the son of the gracious king. This is why he would turn to both Abraham and Rahab to give images of a Jew and a Gentile, the father 
of Israel and a woman named a harlot to say that regardless of your background and where you came from, that faith is imaged through action. So thankful for this weekend. I'm thankful for the grace of God he's given us. I'm thankful that faith works itself out. I'm thankful that we can be a family that works it this way. But I pray that our faith is this pure, undefiled religion. I pray that we can look to that perfect mirror of liberty and pursue Christ. Let us be both hearers and doers of the word as we seek him. Let us pray. Gracious God, thank you for your grace, your goodness. Thank you, Lord, for your love. I pray, Lord, that we're able to see that mirror, to look up in our insecurities, knowing that we deserve not to pray to you, but knowing that you love us the most you can love us in our greatest, and you love us the most you can possibly love us in our worst. Lord, thank you for giving us the understanding there's nothing we can do to add to your love or to take away from it that I am as secure in my worst as I was in my best, and I am secure in you before I was born and after I die. Gracious God, let me look to that liberty to live out my life in this community to where others would see the stability of our faith, see the rock of our faith, and that, Lord, we would point to you. Forgive us of our sins and where we have failed you, and bless us, Lord, with your presence in all things. Let us let others see this liberty. In Christ's name I pray, and amen.